Good evening. It is my sincerest honor to introduce to you all tonight or tonight's speaker, Louise Frankie. Louise has an incredibly impressive and an incredibly long resume, and for that reason, I will not be reading it out for you all tonight in length. <laughs> However, I will offer her completion of the Hudson Political Studies Fellowship and a recent Rhodes Scholarship as just a few of many, many testaments to her intellectual and academic accomplishments. Instead, tonight, I want to focus on what makes Louise such a fascinating and inspirational student of political theory. I met Louise two years ago when, by Fortuna's powerful hand, a clerical error, she was assigned to be my mentor. <laughs> Through my friendship with Louise, I am often humbled by her deep wisdom, unshakable kindness, and a lightheartedness that can make even the most serious conversations enjoyable. What has always stood out to me about Louise's approach to reading and philosophy is her deep questions and demand for explanation. And it is this that makes her such a formidable student. One can trust that any answer or response she proposes has been formed and tested with great intention, thoughtfulness, and objectivity through an extensive inquiry that she demands of her peers and herself alike. I am so grateful to get to call Louise a mentor, an inspiration in and peer of my own studies, and most importantly, a friend. Tonight we get to listen to the culmination of Louise's tireless work on her senior thesis as she presents on Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, in which she will inquire into the social and political conditions necessary to achieve the effecting of all things possible. And so, without further ado, I would like to welcome Ms. Louise Frankie to the podium. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that beautiful introduction, and thank you, everyone who came out today. I see lots of new and old friends, um, and I feel really lucky that there's such a captive audience at Clemson to talk about the new Atlantis. Um, before I begin laying out what exactly I've been attempting to learn over the past year about the so-called science of manipulation, some thanks are due. So to my friends and family who have teased me relentlessly for the past year for writing a thesis on manipulation, thank you for keeping me sane and grounded. To the Lyceum program, and particularly to Dr. Hoffpower, thank you for introducing me to the world of ideas and supporting my every endeavor for the past four years. And finally, to my senior thesis advisor, and truly the single most giving person on the planet, Dr. Adam Michael Thomas, who has dealt with my unhinged and often baseless theories on the New Atlantis, general indignance, and fear of writing for almost a year now. Thank you so much for everything. Your friendship, among a few others in the room, is what I'm most thankful to Clemson for. So, to begin, I will say a few words on the story of the New Atlantis and then on the structure of what I've attempted to do with it before launching into one of the particular examples I analyze in this thesis, The Feast of the Family. So The New Atlantis is the title of a short narrative, only 46 pages, written by Francis Bacon, who you are likely to know as the founder of a new method of scientific inquiry or as the founder of modern political thought. Though now famous, the work was not published until after his death and is unfinished, ending amid a speech. It's Bacon's sole poetic work and tells the story of a ship of European sailors that lands upon the previously unknown island of Benzalem, which appears to be a state of miraculous technological and scientific innovation, safety, and health. Over the course of the narrative, one unnamed sailor comes to learn much about the utopia of Benzalem, both experientially and through conversation with governmental and scientific officials. He's particularly struck by the customs and traditions of Benzalem surrounding the institution of the family and gender relations, as well as with the miraculous nature of the health and happiness of the citizens of Benzalem. Of particular importance to understanding Benzalem is its basic societal structure, consisting of rule by the scientific institute called Solomon's House, made up of so-called fathers or scientists over the general citizens. In between these two extremes of the social hierarchy, the fathers and the citizens, are the governors of each city who seemingly occupy a rung under the fathers and the hermits who live outside the city and perform experiments and occupy the rung directly above the citizens. Thus, the social structure appears to the traveler to consist of the following hierarchy. The fathers or the scientists, the governors or the bureaucrats, the hermits or the experimenters, and the people or the citizens. There's also a king that's alluded to, but he seems to exist outside of the order and never appears in the narrative as a character. Throughout the work, the traveler speaks to various characters about the history and purpose of Benzalem. And finally, here's a speech from the father of Solomon's house in which the father explains the inner workings of the Institute of Solomon's house and ultimately grants the sailor leave to publish the great works of Benzalem around the world for the good of all other nations. Most importantly, the father's final speech reveals the ultimate end of the state of Benzalem, 
the affecting of all things possible. The narrative structure of the New Atlantis is of particular importance to my thesis. In one sense, it may allow Bacon to reveal truths without laying them out explicitly, perhaps enabling him to obscure his central thesis and purpose for writing the work. In another sense, however, the choice of the narrative may be seen as a thought experiment, a method by which he may test his ideas of people and of government, for in a way that a treatise cannot, a narrative can both propose and question an idea. With this in mind, it's necessary to consider three potential intentions of the New Atlantis. One, to act as a glittering, persuasive utopia meant to serve as a beacon illuminating the path that England and the modern world should follow. Two, as a subtly dangerous, inhuman dystopia, cautioning the careful reader away from the potential pitfalls of applying the principles of modern science to all aspects of life. These two dimensions of the work have naturally received the most attention and certainly shed light on the various advantages and disadvantages of modern science. But in this thesis, we'll take up a third alternative. The New Atlantis may be a way to both reveal Bacon's current theory of human nature and test it through cascading means of controlling citizens of Benzalem towards the ultimate end of the state, the affecting of all things possible. If the third is taken to be the purpose of the New Atlantis, as this thesis will argue, a careful reading would reveal the subtle truths of human psychology through the methods necessary for the state to guide its citizens toward its central aim. So, this thesis will consider several components of society in Benzalem for this analysis, but today we are in particular going to take up the Feast of the Family, a tradition revolving around the propagation of children. So, when a man lives to see 30 of his children survive greater than three years of age, children or grandchildren, he's celebrated by the government through the Feast of the Family. The feast is introduced by the narrator as a, quote, most pious, natural, and reverend custom, end quote. Though it centers practically around reproduction, it centers rhetorically around morality and reveals the state's interest in incentivizing both high birth rates and the father's commitment to remaining with this individual family unit. These various complex rituals of the Feast of the Family are the first of many non-traditional but deceptively pragmatic customs, revealed to be inherent to the proper ordering and control of Benzlem, and point to the creation and maintenance of these society as a massive undertaken, undertaking in the application of political science if political science is taken to be, the scientific principles apply to the ordering of political society. So, my thesis argues that these customs were created either to combat or to augment some particular aspect of human nature towards the ends of the state. Their creation thus requires both an extremely precise understanding of human nature and a particularly scientific ruthlessness and execution to utilize this knowledge for organization and control. Though each is towards a different immediate end, each example considered is ultimately guided towards the end of affecting all things possible, and thus can be considered through the same dual lenses of revealing first, a specific understanding of a particular human defect or trait, and second, the use of state manipulation to shape actions resulting from that trait for the purpose of the state. So, back to the Feast of the Family. The ritual begins two days before the feast itself, when the father, who the family calls the Tirsan, begins to consult with friends of his choosing and the governor of the city of his estate, while all of his extended family attend him. At this consultation, all conflicts between family members are sorted out, any affairs of the deceased or newly married are managed, and perhaps most notably, any matters of morality are handled in a sort of domestic tribunal. Quote, there, if any be subject to vice or take ill courses, they are reproved and censored, end quote. The Feast of the Family th seems to act as a catch-all event for formally managing familial matters, through the means of public discussion of individual members of the family alongside the highest ranking member of the city. The governor assists not only as an impartial advisor, but also as a means of transferring additional authority to the father. He, quote, puts in execution by his public authority the decrees and orders of the Tirsan, who is the father. Thus, the supposedly natural authority of the father is in reality protected and executed by the power of the state. So even before the ceremony begins, the ritual of the Feast of the Family seems to be conducted not simply as a reverential nod to the natural power of the Father, but as a necessary means of establishing, not simply augmenting, but in some sense creating, the Father's power over his family and his estate. With the supposed natural authority of the Father, why might it be necessary that the state provide backing to the tradition that cements this authority? That in Benzlem it is considered necessary to have the state present at every occurrence of the tradition could be due to a concern that the natural piety due to a father is not strong enough to compel the family when greed or jealousy is at play. Or, more radically, could the natural piety due to the father in fact be quite arbitrary and thus only enforceable both as a custom and a supposedly human inclination through force? This instance of the governor's presence at the pre-celebration is the first occasion of this potential state instauration and protection of the role of the father 
but many subtler indications of the arbitrary nature of his power are revealed in the ensuing festivities. During the ceremony, the following is said by the citizens of Benzalem, quote, the king is debtor to no man but for the propagation of his subjects, end quote. The king presents the Tirsan, who's the father, with the king's charter, a scroll containing gift of revenue, many privileges, exemptions, and points of honor. It is explicitly stated by the citizens that the sole reason for which the king is beholden to any man, including his subjects, is for the propagation of subjects. The feast thus functions not only as a celebration, but as a transaction. The king pays the father for his work in bringing into existence 30 offspring for the state. Though the line is quite understated by the narrator, it seems remarkable that the king would have only one duty to his subjects, and that this singular duty would stem from the citizens' reproduction rather than their love, virtue, respect, or piety. It is implied that the propagation of subjects, particularly propagation to an extreme degree, is of immense value to the king, but the reasoning behind this is not clear. Benzalem is an island nation and thus cannot expand. It is logical for such a state to attempt to maintain a constant population and thus remain perpetually at a restorative birth rate. However, one father does not come to have 30 progeny in his lifetime by having only two children. So then, what intention does the state have, does a state with the ultimate purpose of affecting all things possible, have with an endlessly growing population? There are several plausible options that we'll consider. One possibility is that there's a large population of citizens out of sight, perhaps working on the outskirts of the city as laborers, experimenters, or in some more sinister role. Another possibility is that the higher total population yields a greater probability of bright, young, moldable citizens that can become productive scientists. Benzalem has a seemingly rigid social hierarchy in which the hermits experiment outside of the city, the citizens produce children within the city, and the fathers of Solomon's house compile knowledge outside of the city and apply the knowledge in the city. Nonetheless, a state governed toward the ends of the advancement of knowledge would necessitate some degree of mobility between these classes. A state directed wholly towards effecting must order each and every attribute to this ultimate end of complete knowledge. Thus, a strict meritocracy is necessary, as is a strict division of labor. With the multitude of inventions in Benzalem, neither food nor health is a problem, and it seems that a nearly endless population could be accounted for by the state with the notable but undiscussed exceptions of space, because it is an island. Therefore, the net benefit of extreme propagation, more naturally intelligent children, comes with no drawbacks. Presumably, there is a method by which children are sorted into their classes, such that the male students with the highest IQs may be tested and educated to become fathers of Solomon's house. So those are the first two options. And a more dramatic option, however, is the possibility of use of human subjects for experimentation. Always in mind when reading the New Atlantis is the lack of protection of the individual. The ultimate end of the state is explicitly the pursuit of knowledge, and though application of much of the resulting knowledge also yields impressively stable and comfortable lives for the citizens, the flourishing of those lives is in no way the purpose of the state. Considering the ultimate end of the state, and the only means by which the governor becomes a debtor, it seems likely that in the end, or that the end in some way, the end in some way must shed light upon the means. There we go. If use of human subjects for experimentation was useful towards the pursuit of practical knowledge, it is only logical that, as there is no equal weighing of individual good alongside the pursuit of knowledge, human experimentation would be necessary and vital to the projects of Solomon's house. Presumably, because the affecting of all things possible clearly entails many human phenomena, including health, nutrition, and senescence, human subjects would be vital to the experiments undertaken by the scientists outside the city. Furthermore, considering the many inventions already found in Benzalem, including among them mountains dug out for the curing of diseases, a special water for the prolongation of life, and chambers of health that alter air for health. It seems very likely that human subjects were utilized in the experimentation that produced these. This argument of the use of human subjects for experimentation as the reason for state encouragement of propagation need not be understood only in the extreme, though. Human subjects are always needed in some sense and to some degree for human endeavors. It is plausible that they are used reasonably with basic consent respected, basic rights established, and a system of volunteers. However, it is also plausible that the sheer extremity of the population size supposedly needed by the state, as well as the lack of protection of individual rights, enables a more sinister use of human subjects. The breadth and depth of discovery that must have occurred to achieve the incredible scientific feats outlined at the very least suggests a vast scale of experimentation a scale which almost seems to require the kind of otherwise unreasonable population levels explicitly encouraged by the feast of the family. That is, the level of innovation in Benzalem may necessitate extreme population growth, 
both for subjects upon which to experiment, as well as for greater numbers of scientifically inclined individuals who can be brought into the father in, as fathers of Solomon's house. So, finally, turning back to the events of the final day of the Feast of the Family, there's an elaborate ceremony to honor the father. The visual of the room is quite striking. The father enters a room with a chair of an ivy canopy of silver and silk, a table, and a carpet. His lineage accompanies him in a procession with the males before him and the females following him. The mother of the family is notably absent from most of the description of the Feast of the Family, and of her role only the following is said. Quote, if there be a mother from whose body the whole lineage is descended, there's a traverse placed in a loft above the right hand of the chair with a privy door and a carved window of glass leaded with gold and blue, where she sitteth but is not seen. Though this woman has given birth to the entirety of the lineage of the family, there's no component of the so-called Feast of the Family that honors her as a member of this family. Rather, the father's counterpart is subjected to both complete concealment and isolation from the festivities. She's not included in the procession, but is allowed to watch from an elevated compartment in the room. Indeed, she sitteth, but is not seen. It seems that the Feast of the Family should rather be called the Feast of the Father. The mother is intentionally kept out of sight and out of mind, allowing the father to singularly assume the throne-like chair and the full attention and reverence which it so naturally commands. So, the question now becomes why it is necessary for the mother to be hidden from view at the Feast of the Family while the father sits on a quasi-throne. If the father has a natural authority in the family, there's no plausible reason to hide the mother. If she's naturally meek and inclined toward child rearing, why keep her from view? She would not naturally attract attention. She could easily sit behind or even beside the father without causing any upheaval. By its inclusion in the narrative, this custom reveals that there must be a hidden understanding of women behind its inception, a reason for which it is necessary to keep this exceptionally productive mother locked away, unseen, in a wooden chamber, while celebrating the institution of the family. The answer may be approached by considering again the potential purpose of the Feast of the Family, propagation, to the greater purpose of Benzalem, the pursuit of complete knowledge, and how the role of the mother relates to these purposes. As will be analyzed in a later section of this piece, women are rarely mentioned in the New Atlantis and are incapable of serving as scientists or clearly as fathers of Solomon's house. There's certainly an argument that this is due to an implicit understanding of women as less naturally inclined both towards knowledge and to rule, such that Bacon may have revealed that women are best utilized in private life within the family. However, if Bacon truly believed that women are less inclined to knowledge and to rule, and accordingly content with lives consisting of childbirth and childrearing, he would not confine this mother to an elevated chamber during the feast celebrating her life's work. It seems more likely that this strange and certainly misogynistic custom has practical consequences than that it is rooted in any sort of genuine belief. The possibility that emerges is thus a much deeper, much more twisted understanding of both the difference between the sexes and the relationship between them, which will be further, de ugh, further developed in coming sections but begins with this elevated wooden box. Within the context of the Feast of the Family, the role of the father seems to require elevation by the state to retain, and perhaps even to originally gain, respect. Fathers may be naturally deficient from that which would be most efficient for the state. That is, though perhaps what would be best for the state would be the traditional understanding of the father, naturally commanding, devoted to his family, respected in the sorting of familiar, familial and particularly moral affairs, and invested in having children. This is not the natural father as understood by Bacon. He must be made into this by the state, into this family man who best serves the ends of the state through the propagation of children and the cultivation of stable families. Further clarity on why the supposedly natural authority derived from filial piety and the natural ordering of the family needs the power of the state behind it may be found in the meaning of Tirson, which is the name given to fathers in Benzalem. As noted by Bacon's secretary in the footnotes, Tirson is a Persian word meaning timid or fearful. The father, though exp explicitly the strongest force within society in Benzalem, has been shown to require the force of the state to govern the affairs of his house. The use of Tirson as the father's name may shed light on the actual and anticipated qualities of the father. It seems to imply one of two possibilities. The father is either naturally timid and must be made less so for his role in the success of the state, or he must be made timid and fearful by the state in order to properly fulfill this role. The latter seems more likely, as a fearful and thus obedient citizen is more useful to the end of this particular state. Analysis of this name choice and other components of the Feast of the Family has suggested its function as a series of intentional customs crafted to establish the father's authority within the family 
incentivize fertility, and clearly divide men and women in terms of role and therefore value, each of which, each of which is seemingly necessary to guide the actions of the citizens towards the ultimate end of the state in Benzlem. My thesis has attempted to analyze Bacon's understanding of human beings and how that understanding can be operationalized in a state with the ultimate end of knowledge or the affecting of all things possible. I've taken the view of Bacon as neither endorsing nor cautioning against such a utopia. His goal with the New Atlantis was rather to create his only work on psychology and understand the human mind more fully through semi-scientific and semi-literary methods. The two most important implications of Bacon's results, if taken seriously, are the following. Abstractly, people are understandable, extremely complicated and layered individuals, but understandable. Accordingly, there's a natural, fixed human nature, a sort of pattern of humanness, which can be discovered through psychology, the science of human activity. As with all fields of science, the knowledge discovered concerning human beings can be used toward innovation and towards action, and Benzlem thus serves as an example of how the science of the human mind could be utilized towards one particular end. Bacon does not prescribe us with a path forward, but does provide us with the knowledge we may use to choose with the best understanding possible between the unobstructive pursuit of knowledge and other alternatives of modern life. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Will Galloway. So if the goal of the city is the affecting of all things possible, that implies there's some things that can't be affected. How do we know what those are and what does Benzema make of those things? Um, well, it seems like most any, anything that can be affected will be affected. So the, like the last third of the New Atlantis is a speech which lays out everything that has been affected and everything that's currently being pursued. So that entails kind of anything, na any sort of natural science thing that you can think of. Um, it's never said what cannot be affected, but I think from my reading, what can't be affected are those fixed attributes. So kind of the fixed human things can't be affected is what I'm arguing. And um, yeah, just a few kind of eternal truths that around which all of science has to navigate, if that makes sense. Luca. Yeah, I can elaborate on why. I, so I think there's, there's two different readings for this that I, I touched on, but um, we'll get into another section. So either there's a genuine understanding that it would be better for the end of the state, for the woman to be subjected to private life only. So that, that would be one understanding. It would be more yeah. pragmatic. It would be more effective, right? The other understanding is that um, women are too powerful in the sense that um, you can't have both of the sexes on the same level. And so I would, in the sense that if the end of the state is the affecting of all things possible, it's more practical to have one of the sexes subjugated. And in this case, it's women. Does that help at all? And particularly towards the children, um, the argument would be that the natural piety that we would consider the children has, to, the child has towards the father, is in fact not nearly as strong as we consider it to be, and therefore, for the proper ordering of the state and the most efficient kind of family life possible and the least amount of chaos, you have to augment that piety towards the father by sort of directing everything towards the father. So that's why you would keep the mother hidden, put the father on a throne. That's kind of how I see it. Mason. So does Bacon's, I know you said you wrote this like kind of, this came after he died and it was just kind of unfinished, but did Bacon see this as like his utopia? Like this is like the goal of human life or is this just like a narrative thought experiment to like what could be the case if such and such happened? That's the question. Um, I, the, the Wikipedia says that this is his, 
this is his like ultimate state. And there's there is like serious scholarship that says that this is um, like the Solomon's house is like the model for the modern research institution. So that's like that's a whole argument. And then there's a whole another argument that um, this is exactly what not to do. This is the path we should not go down. And that was the kind of where I originally started off with this. And now I've kind of arrived at the understanding that it's the thought experiment because I think that um, makes the most sense with all of the sort of crazy advantages and disadvantages that are brought to light. Like I don't see it as necessarily pushing one particular um, agenda, but there's definitely both of those are very mainstream and well thought out points of view on the New Atlantis. Sergio. Is fear the only passion driving or fear the only passion that is the principle of this government or is there also like a, is this also like a political virtue? In the citizen? Yeah. Or just in the government? Um, so the individual citizen does not matter as I understand it. All that matters is the affecting of all things possible. So um, the individual virtue of the citizen, simply not a problem, not a thing. Um, in terms of like fear and emotions, it seems like they play most off of fear, but each, each sort of emotion or each sort of thing we might consider virtue, but in the state it's not really virtue, is truly just a means. Like it's to be used towards the end of controlling the people. And even that is not, the goal is not control. The goal is the affecting of all things possible. And it's, and that goal just requires having a sort of quiet, productive state with the least amount of chaos. And so that's why it's intentionally designed in that way. And that's why fear is kind of a primary driver of people. And so um, that's why it's used for control, I think. Helen Schmidt. So given that the mother seems to have this stronger connection with her children, wouldn't it be much more effective to actually have the mother be that role in the state? Because she can direct these children more effectively towards that effective all things possible. Like, it seems arbitrary that they chose the father over the mother. And I'm sorry if you were to explain this, but I just I don't really get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so I would argue that neither the mother nor the father has an effect on the children being, like, raised, really. They're, the children, in, to my understanding, are probably kind of brought up by the state. So they're brought up within their families because that's conducive to like the greatest like results in terms of just like quantitative results. But um, in terms of education, in terms of like inspiration and like what the end of the state would be, all of that would be done by the state. And so I think the mother kind of just serves the role of the private kind of like housemaker and not educating in any sort of sense. And I, I mean, I agree that I think it is arbitrarily chosen. That's like the most radical claim I make, I think. I don't really make it here, but, um, but I think it's, it's arbitrary in the sense that I think it could be the father or the mother, but it's not arbitrary in the sense that if you're trying to make this story have any sort of persuasive aspect, you're not going to have the woman be, you're not gonna have the father in the private sphere and the mother not, you're not gonna have mothers of Solomon's house. That just wouldn't be persuasive to most. Emily. Um, you said at the end that like part of what the ceremony does is like incentivize fertility, right? Mm -hmm. Like, could you like clarify how like lock, I just like raising really you know, like, that's like how locking mom up, <laughs> right? Or like if giving her position at all, like how that would incentivize fertility or like is it more for the men or something? Well, by incentivizing fertility, I mean that the, the ritual is done for a man who has 30 offspring. So, like, that's the sense in which it incentivizes fertility. For the women, I think um, my understanding is that that's kind of all there is to being, like, a woman in this society. Uh, not in any sort of, like, grand way, but just in the sense that you're relegated to the private sphere. So, like, all honor would come from this ceremony. This is a huge ceremony. So even if you're locked away because all attention has to go on the father, then, I mean, it, it still seems like it would incentivize fertility in the sense that the family is the entirety of the woman's life, and then this is the highest honor the family can have, so therefore this is the highest honor the woman can have. Um, Will Bilbrow. Okay, so this may be a little out there, so I might have to ask you afterwards. Okay. Um, but, so do we know what happens to the women if they're not the mother of all 30 children? 
Um, I've thought about this. We don't know. But I think there's a, a huge emphasis in the New Atlantis on like staying with the same person your entire life. And so in another section, there's a lot on marriage and on chastity. And so I think that it has something to do with that, with the fact that um, it incentivizes staying with the same person your entire life. I'm not sure if like the first mother had died and then there was a second mother. I was actually talking about this the other day. I'm not sure what that would entail. I, I think if the second mother could reach 30, she would be allowed to be in a chamber too. But I don't, I don't, um, that's just my intuition on it. Okay, and I, I've, got, I've got kind of a tricky question. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> so, if Solomon's temple, or Solomon's house and everything, like that's outside of the city, am I right? They, they work outside the city and they come in the city to... I, it's not clear like where it is positioned, but it's, it's mysterious. Okay. in terms of what happens inside. It's only revealed at the very end. So, do you think maybe um, the mother could be alluded to being in Solomon's house up here while the family becomes the city itself, now having all the political authority? <laughs> so, so the box is on the Solomon's house and, and she's got this like, Position mm -hmm. the city. I will consider that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I like the idea, but I don't think that it um, has much of a basis. <laughs> I was just curious. <laughs> was um, Meredith. Um, you've talked about individual rights not being respected by the state. Um, <coughs> and then you've also mentioned, though, how the state takes fear into account a lot. Can you somehow explain what the citizens' lives are like in terms of like having a quote-unquote good life or maybe being happy. Um, is fear the only thing that they try to mitigate the state, or does happiness somehow play a role? Um, yeah, happiness does play a role. I think I'm still trying to understand happiness in the New Atlantis. To my understanding, happiness is different for each of these classes of people. Happiness is only said eight times in the New Atlantis, and Every time that it's said with regards to the citizens, it, um, to me, harkens to a sense of security rather than flourishing. So it's like, we say, they say they're happy when they're um, fed or when they're, you know, it, it's never alluded to in terms of honor, in terms of good, or in terms of flourishing or anything. So um, in terms of happiness, I would say that happiness, the word is used, and happiness, the concept, in terms of keeping people materially satisfied is certainly used. That's kind of like the byproduct of the affecting of all things possible, is that you have all these miraculous medicines and all of these miraculous foods. They have these lovely little clementine-like things that just like, they're like balls of health and they eat them and they're healthy. Um, and then there's all these like crazy instruments. And so all of that has the natural cause of producing sort of like technology and innovation, but it, that keeps the people materially satisfied. But all of that in itself is just towards further discovery. It's not for the people. So I, I would say happiness, if happiness is understood as security and like material satisfaction is used, but fear definitely to me seems to be, well, I guess I would say about an equal driver. Fear and then material satisfaction. Yep. Mason. Um, is there any place for the divine or any like God outside of the New Atlantis or is it purely Yeah, so they are Christians, and there is a lot of um, really interesting rhetoric. It seems to be like a sort of false Christianity. They, um, they have a whole story of how they came to know Christianity, and it's not through a saint. It's through this whole elaborate story of how they found the books and this pillar of light over the ocean, and then they, uh, their, their boats were their boats were all around this pillar of light. They all stopped, and then all of a sudden, one was allowed to go. And there's this whole like elaborate um, thing around Christianity. But it seems like Christianity is just used here towards the end of the state. It doesn't seem like it's not a very deep Christianity. Um, it's there's not much love there. Um, and then the big thing would be that it is an island nation, and it is like founded. We know the founding story, and the founding comes before religion is introduced. So religion is therefore just 
I would argue, purpose towards the founding that's already there. It's just kind of used as a means to keep people um, within control. And I think that the only reason that it is, I mean, there are many reasons it could be Christianity, but in my, from my perspective, it only seems to be Christianity because, once again, that's what would be most um, persuasive, right? It doesn't, it seems, it seems like a very um, sad version of Christianity. Dr. Daniels? But, but how, so, I mean, it's interesting that Nathan raised this point because I was thinking about the, the sort of the solution to all the problems that they have, you know, the, the mines and the, and the towers and you know, these half mile tall buildings and everything that they discuss. Uh, it's the fruit, you know, the magic fruit that they eat and it makes everybody healthy and so on. But it's also this depiction of no religious conflict, right? They talk to a Jew who lived there mm -hmm. completely unmolested by. By the Christians, and, and they, it's not just a matter of toleration, it's kind of a matter of everybody just gets along. Right. And that somehow this, this you know, thought experiment, or perhaps this ideal utopia, has, uh, in addition to you know, providing such fecundity of their women, has also led them to be completely kind of tolerant, and thus the muting of religion. So how, how do you think that plays into maybe the way that the state needs to reinforce certain structures, given that those structures don't come from uh, a faith tradition? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that you bring up um, Jobin because he seems to me to be like somewhat stripped of his Jewishness. Like he's he's a, a practical Jewish person for the state. So um, he's described as not as I think it is as being uh, fully respectful of other religions. Like that's one of the full lines that he's given or something. And so he seems to be. Jewish as a character so that they can place him outside and so therefore he can talk about everything going within but also I mean I guess to show that there's religious tolerance but it seems mostly his role is to be sort of the political scientist character who can actually reveal to us the way that things are more so than these every other character who has to be in some way um, within his own context. Jobin's able to be outside in some way because he doesn't have this sort of mind. Um, going on. Sergio. If the goal of the state is to affect all things possible and, and they really want to pass sort of like everyone inside the city or not affect it, if they want everyone in the religion to be controlled of the, of the government, why allow like, the hermits to live outside the city? I'm glad you asked. So the hermits, um, so they live outside the city. No one, can, none of the citizens can go outside of the city within a, a mile and a half outside. The hermits live in these mountains and in these caves, these man-made mountains and caves, and they just sit around all day and they affect things, so they just experiment. <laughs> they just experiment, 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 and the key is that they don't actually compile any of these things. So science in um, the New Atlantis is divided in between like the affecting and then the compilation, which is done by the fathers of Solomon's house who then take all the results of everything and compile, 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 draw the connections. And the whole, the whole final speech is really fun and it kind of describes how all these things are woven together and it seems to be like, um, like, a, like a system that goes up where there's, you have the people who collect all the information and they might like collect like physics and then there might be someone who collects physics and chemistry and there's someone who collects physics and chemistry and biochemistry and all of these things kind of, no one has complete knowledge. So, sorry, to go back to your question, the hermits really have no knowledge. They just have like, here's what to do, do it, report your results, here's another thing to do. And so they're kind of servants of sorts. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say they're slaves, but they're definitely somewhat captive. They just live in these mountains. They don't have families, it seems. And uh, that's why I said they're kind of a tier above the citizen, but they could also be considered a tier below because they are workers, but they also have more knowledge than the citizens because they're outside the city. They know to some degree what it is that's behind the miraculous sort of nature of the city. Um, but then, sorry, just to get to the other part of the point, it seems like no one except, no one at all has all of the knowledge together. All of the knowledge just gets stored kind of on some giant bookshelf somewhere. The, the, the goal isn't for one particular individual to have knowledge. It's just for all of knowledge to be affected, I think. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I was gonna ask, like, what's the purpose of hiding all the knowledge? I don't know if it's hidden, I shouldn't have said hidden. It, it's hidden in the sense that it's outside of the city, but the effects of it, like the innovations and stuff, are obviously used in the city. 
I'm not sure what the effect of hiding all, hiding all of it together would be. I think it's efficiency in the sense that it's more efficient to gather more knowledge to pull up the particular people you want working and pull them in and slowly have them all tick away at complete knowledge than it is to just let loose knowledge and then the chaos that would ensue from that. So it's easier to control everyone and also control who knows what towards the end of knowing everything than it is to allow everyone the pursuit of knowledge, if that makes sense. That's, that's also intuition, though, I think. Uh, Charlie. Yeah, so I guess this is kind of a simpler question, but, but how is reading the new branch affected the way I wish you kind of look at the modern world? Like, what elements, if any, do you see in our modern society? Um, any, like, big revelations? Any, any, anything? Um, I think when I first read it, I was, I was more struck by things that, I was more likely to be struck by things. It was in a place where I was like, wow, this is modern science. Um, I think le more so now, um, well, it has made me wonder a lot about whether people really are understandable in a scientific sense, because the conclusion I come to here is that they're super, super complicated. It's very difficult to understand all of the different human passions and everything, but that they are understandable. And so I think that has had an impact in the sense that um, it seems that there is like a sort of science to people that I didn't really consider before. It's not a super great answer, but Dr. Hoffbauer. Two questions. Um, have, have you thought much about whether the Peace of the Family is a big send up? Of um, a command to be fruitful and multiply, and these sort of existing, especially powerfully in Bacon's time, of a family structure, subservient to another power. And then, second of all, um, could you talk to us a little bit about whether or not this all inspires the politics of hope? And you started to talk about this a moment ago, but especially in light of the sort of destitute situation of everyone who arrives. Mm -hmm. relief through science. Could you say the second again in another way? Yeah, could you speak with us about the new science of hope or the politics of hope as, in, as, as might be inspired in all of those people who were dying on a boat yes. and okay. across Penn Salem and said, oh my goodness, this is relief of my estate. Right. Yeah, this seems to be the, the, the phrase would be relief from, from man's estate is what is offered here. Um, there's hope. So I think to Sergio's original question about the different ways that we might read the New Atlantis, the first obvious and beautiful sort of way is that everyone is taken care of here. Everyone has health and um, life just uh, as, a, as a benchmark. So I mean, in a, in a more lovely, in a more rose-colored glasses view, we might think that everyone's materially satisfied. We could reach the heights of everything, not just science. We could reach the heights of of art and we could reach the heights of everything. And this, in this sense, it's very hopeful because it offers, especially because it's coming from Bacon, who would actually kind of be able to see the direction that things are going. It offers um, hope that we might one day be able to actually materially satisfy everyone and kind of reach this state of um, non-emergency, like I guess one might say, a state in which everything can be um, done at leisure. So that's hopeful, certainly. And I think that um, what Bacon does so well is not push this in the direction of there being the heights of art and the heights of music and the heights of love and the heights of you know, poetry and everything. Um, he shows us that perhaps in the pursuit of this lovely material satisfaction that we might all want, we might actually kind of lose something that allowed us to produce those other beautiful things. And so even if there's, there's a lot of hope here um, in terms of what modern science might do for us, but it's careful, it's a hope. That, that's kind of why I wanted to offer this as neither pushing us in either direction because it's kind of, here are the, the wonderful things that, we would, that would come out of this endless life and um, we wouldn't have to worry about our, our condition, our material condition, but here's also what we might accidentally lose along the way, to put it in a kind of a trite way. And then I, I still don't really understand your first question. Is, it, is the Feast of the Family a send-up of the dominant family structure as commanded? 
That's yes, this, this could be the case. Um, I would offer, I mean, it is certainly in terms of persuasion, in terms of like, it's compelling because we already kind of recognize this structure and in that way it's a send up and it doesn't go against what, what we already naturally think. But um, I don't think it would, it's a very like reverent send up if it is one. It doesn't seem to, I mean, I don't see why um, the woman has to be in the box. I don't see why we, why the, the whole festivity only lasts for two hours. There's no um, beauty in the festivity. There's no laughter. There's no, it's supposedly like the big holiday that happens once in your lifetime. And there doesn't seem to be very much that's very human about it. Everything is super formal, super formulaic. Um, and there doesn't seem to be much divinity in there, to me at least. And also the, um, the phrase that's said is that the father is the debtor for the propagation. There's nothing alluded to that there might be any sort of greater value than propagation. It's not propagation towards God's ends. It's just propagation. So I don't know if that's. So are you moving to it being ironic? That's what I'm asking. Uh, like they're like, oh, this is so blessed, and nothing was as beautiful, whatever the exact language is. Is it ironic? Is what I'm asking. I, I think I think it is. Well. Um, I think it is ironic, but I don't know if it's ironic in the, I mean, ironic to the reader. I don't think it's ironic to, I don't think it's understood by those there to be irony in any sense. I think it's very much putting people in a very specific set of conditions and trying to know how they would act there, if that makes sense. I don't think there's any irony in the moment. I think it might be ironic for us to look at. Yeah. Um, Emily. Um, it seems like this whole shebang, right, is like really contingent on, the, uh, I guess, the father's desire for honor, mm -hmm. right? So then it's like, are, what, if any, measures are taken elsewhere in the city or in the state to, like, prevent that desire for honor from, like, disrupting the order of things? Yes, good question. So um, it's the rigidity of the social classes that means that if you're a father, that means you're a citizen, and that means that you are not going to be anything else. You're not going to be a, a hermit or experimenter, and you're not going to be a father of Solomon's house because your role is, your primary role, I guess is important to say, is to be a father, is to have children and raise them. And then it's not really clear whether those fathers also have sort of secondary roles as bakers or artisans. I would argue they probably do just because if the point is to perfectly satisfy these people, I doubt that people would be perfectly satisfied um, just simply being fathers, but it's not really indicated. Dr. Daniels. Um, I, just, I don't exactly remember, but just to, to maybe put another wrinkle on Dr. Hoffbauer's question, is it, is it construed by Bacon as being a frequent thing? I mean, one, one, might, one might wonder uh, in, in, you know, in his mind, the guy that actually, you know, accomplishes 30 children that was raised to adulthood, I mean, here's the first, you know, infant mortality, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if this stupendous thing happened, let's have a ridiculous ceremony and, and right. sort of celebrate the fact that this, this thing that doesn't happen often is happening. Right. Or is it, is it sort of depicted as, like, every father aspires to this, and this is like a goal? Yeah. So there are two different minds to this, in my perspective. Um, so it's every progeny that reaches above the age of three. So I took that to be children or grandchildren, and then it's above the age of three. So when we did the math, it actually is, <laughs> is not super difficult to reach that if you have four children, they have their four children. Um, so it seems like if the end of the state is propagation, if you're materially satisfied, and if your job is to be a father, this would probably happen fairly often. And also it seems like this is the one thing for which the father is a debtor. The only, I mean, sorry, the king is a debtor. So the only reason that the king is beholden to the citizen is for this. To me, it indicates that this is like the goal. This is the thing that every father strives for. And also the way in which there's the pre-celebration festivities and that kind of um, is done to settle the affairs of the estate and everything sounds very to me sounds very repetitive and sounds like this is kind of the governor's role and this is just how this works. And I, I think my assumption is that this happens often. Um, this happens for every father, but it's kind of like something you strive for. 
Luca. It seems to me that there are a lot of things outside the realm of the Iowa nation. So what, if anything, do you think Francis Bacon meant by keeping this state that affects all things held within just one language? Yeah, great question. Um, a, few, a few points on this one. So Benzlem spies on everyone as in Benzlem spies on every, every state, right, and knows all of their innovations and knows everything that's going on and has the histories, has everything, has eyes everywhere. And I'm not sure who those spies are. I'm assuming they're like another, maybe another class of people. But at the same time, no one knows about Benzlem, right? So they are this miraculous state of innovation, but um, they're really kind of just thieves. And also they affect a lot of things, but they're not, there's no sort of like the dual scientific communication thing going on. So that's, that's one point to it. Um, and then the other thing is that, I briefly touched on this, but barely, the very end of um, the Father of Solomon's speech, which is how the entire thing ends, and also which is unfinished, is him saying, him allowing the sailor to go back and bring everything that he has learned, both experientially and through talking to all these different leaders, and then finally talking to the Father of Solomon's house who actually lays out the way that things actually are, and take it back to the modern world. So that's kind of like the culminating big thing of the story is what is he going to do with this information if it's even true. I mean, if it's even true that they let him go was kind of the other implication perhaps. But um, so in that sense, people have read that as uh, modern science kind of can't stay put. It has to be spread, right? Because it has to affect all these things and it needs new, new things to affect and the innovation just can't, can't be stifled. Um, and then the other sense of reading it is kind of like this hope sense that uh, Benzlem, though it was extremely scared for so long to open its borders, might now actually send off its knowledge and innovation to the rest of the world in order to provide hope for the rest of the world through science. Does that get to your question? Okay. Dr. Thomas. Good question. Um, my, I would like to say that the affecting of all things possible is towards something, right? I would like to say that's towards the highest things and towards, you know, beauty, nobility, uh, happiness, and stuff. I don't think that that's indicated in the New Atlantis. Sadly, I think that the the what we that would be too easy because then it would be oh let's gear everything towards this and therefore this will end up being towards the highest things and then we'll achieve the highest things. I think that um, where, this is also, I don't know if this is true, but I'm, I'm gonna say it anyway. I think where Bacon would come down is that um, it's not that simple and if, if you wanna have, there has to be some sort of balance. The pursuit of everything can't just yield the highest things because the highest things would be pursued in themselves probably. Um, and then it, just in terms of the fathers, like more specifically to your question, I think their psychology is that they're the most ambitious people and the most ambitious thing that can be done in this society is to contribute in the grandest way to the affecting of all things possible, which is to gain as much control as you can over as much knowledge as you can. And I don't think um, their psychology, I don't, I don't really think it's about I think it's kind of, they're in this mindset where nothing is really real except what can be affected. And therefore, you get in this sort of tunnel vision of affecting everything. And I, I, to my understanding, I don't think those people are taking much time in their day to consider anything other than the affecting because the way that they got 
to the point of being a scientist, a father of Solomon's house, is by the single-minded pursuit of affecting all things. And so each of those people, their ambition, in my mind, is just to contribute as much as they possibly can to this growing pile of knowledge. And that is kind of like the height, is to contribute, and then therefore eventually to approximate all knowledge and to be just a piece of that, because no one, I don't think any of them has ambitions of understanding everything. That wouldn't be the type of person that would be chosen, because that's not practical, if that makes sense. Dr. Pierce. Uh, it seems paradoxical. The whole thing is all things possible we're going to try to make real and therefore arrive at the great new world or a new form of civilization informed by new ways of knowing and applying knowledge and stuff. But then the paradox seems to be that uh, we'll affect all Yeah, I think, um, so I take affecting to be kind of like the strict sense of the word. I don't take it to be anything that would be creative or anything that is kind of chosen. So to me, affecting doesn't include every society that could possibly exist. And it also doesn't include anything that is creative. So anything that can't just be dot, 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 like affected, like create anything that ha ex includes like an X factor is not included. So that doesn't go to the gender relations, but that goes to the first piece of it. And then anything, the, if the point is the affecting of all things possible, then very well they could have gender equality and very well they could have anything they possibly wanted because everything is at their fingertips. But if the point is the affecting of all things possible, th that's just not They've, in my mind, they as social scientists have determined that this is the most conducive way to do that. And so whether it's conservative or not, I don't, I don't think it's conservative in so far, in so far as it um, just doesn't care about the individual at all. So there would be no purpose for experimenting with gender equality because it's, I mean, if this is efficient to run society this way towards the affecting of all things possible, What's the purpose of either individual rights or of gender equality? I don't know if that gets to your question exactly, but to me that's why, why you wouldn't reach sort of the normal utopian state. Because the, in lots of utopias, the individual seems to be extremely important. And even if it's just about their material satisfaction, they are kind of like the primary unit. And here explicitly, the individual is not the primary aim. So then it really doesn't matter what any individual's experience or life is like. Yeah, to say what's possible is to sort of beg the question, like, is, is possibility, what is what, the possibility, well, what, that's the same to say what are the, what are the limits of the actual, or what are the limits of reality, or even the, reli the limits of nature, is to say, ask the same question, so you're kind of two sides of the same coin. Kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and that would be creative, in my mind, to try to think of a new, like way of living, way of being would be creative and not affecting, if that makes sense. That would be kind of the, the line between the two, I think. Do yeah, this sort of final yeah. question. One of the opening statements you made was about faith and this sort of father. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us exactly what you had in mind there and, and, and what we should do with that piece of information? Um, so, Bacon is a father of modernity. I mean, I think he comes at exactly the right time to be thinking both about modern science and politics. There aren't many who are both practitioners of politics and writers of philosophy and also 
in some sense, scientist. It's kind of arguable how much of a scientist he was. But um, in that way, he's a modern, because all of these things are of equal importance, that seems to be one, and because he can foresee the direction that modernity is going. I guess he's not quite on the cusp of the ancients, but he's thought a lot about the ancients, and also is right before kind of the explosion of, of modernity, I would say, in terms of, well, he can foresee it, I guess is what I'm trying to say, and that in, in this and in, um, through his experiences, I guess. I don't know. What'd you say? Say more. <laughs> I think he died, though, conducting scientific experiments, like he was working on chickens. It was on so uh, steak. Was a scientist. Yeah, but a lot of what he did was just compiling other people's work. And the view of nature, I think, is different, and that's what I was wondering if you would talk to us about. The view of a nature to be owned up to versus a nature to be mastered, and then, and then bent to your own satisfaction. Well. That's what I was wishing for. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would say, I would say all of this is, is about um, how we would, how we can potentially bend everything towards our will, for sure. And in that way, he is a modern. But I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't think that he's telling us we ought to do so. So he's kind of telling us this is a possibility. And in that sense, he seems more ancient, I would argue, but that's not um, necessarily the case. Thank you very much, Louise.